welcome to world building as a character absolutely we have with us michael underwood marshall ryan maresca let me know if i'm pronouncing that correctly and valerie valdez who are all awesome fantasy sci-fi writers as well as georgina key representing the literary fiction part of our uh, uh, programming absolutely thank you so much for joining us y'all thank you so why am I, think, I don't know why thank you <laughs> so let's start off with My instinctive response yes i uh, uh, <laughs> let's start off with and i'm going to try to call on but feel free to jump in you know jump on top of uh, uh, each other things if, if any question really hits you absolutely um, what are some strategies that y'all use when you're editing after you already have the story to deepen your world? Marshall, if I can ask you that first. Ooh, that's that. Ooh, that, that that's an interesting one to jump in with. Um, so strategies while editing. Um, I think the big thing, and here's the thing where I rely on like my editors and my 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 secondary readers, my beta readers around is, you know, look for the things that they are like, hey, what was this about? Can can you explain this a bit more and such? Because one of the things I found, especially when it comes to world building in, in fantasy and science fiction, is the more I've done this, the more I've realized how much you don't need to explain. And I think there is, there, there is a big tendency, especially you know, as a as an early writer in the genre, to want to be like, no, I have to tell you all these things. I have to make it clear, like the the history of this or the how this technology works and all that. And most of the times, you actually don't need to. So in the editing process, like first in the drafting process, I have now I have now basically trained myself to under explain these things and then use my first reactions from my editors and my beta readers of which things actually need to be explained deeper and which things just stand on their own as just elements of the world building. Heck yeah. And Georgina, I see that you're uh, uh, unmuted. So I'm going to call on you next. Absolutely. Is there anything that you use kind of as a strategy, maybe a uh, uh, charts or a uh, uh, drawings or, you know, just do um, well, that help? I mean I, my writing, because I deal with um, sort of, I don't deal in the fantasy sci-fi world, is very much based on reality for the most part. And I actually pick settings that I know really well. It's very hard for me to make up settings. Um, so I, if I can, I actually go to the place that I'm writing about and immerse myself in that place um, and just soak up the nuances and the ambience and 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 really sort of try to observe the natural world and the way people interact with it and so that's a primary part of me including world building but as i'm going through my manuscript when i'm editing or revising i really just kind of look for those places where i can use setting to um, add that sort of subtext to my characters. So uh, uh, for instance, you know, my last book, it, it, it was a year long, the, the setting happened within a year. And so the seasons changing actually reflected the, the growth of this primary character. And so when I could, I would just incorporate very specific and hopefully usually kind of lyrical passages that would reflect what my character was feeling or thinking. Thank you, absolutely. Valerie, have you ever, you know, uh, uh, dipped three dried mushrooms in peanut butter and then tried to travel to exactly where your world building setting is? <laughs> I do not think that mushroom and peanut butter is a combination I usually have except in some stir fries. But at, that said, adding mushrooms is a thing that I definitely did in my last work in progress. But um, 
that actually speaks to what Georgina was saying. There's a lot, uh, one thing that I like to do is go back and layer in details that are very specific to the setting, trying to find ways to uh, leverage that specificity to uh, enhance the descriptions that I have. Uh, I like to also feather them into dialogue, for example, just anything that you can do to bring the world even more into whatever it is that you're doing, finding things like uh, particular ways that the people in that world are going to curse, for example, uh, turns of phrase that you're looking for ones that are too modern to um, uh, English specific or our world specific and just twisting them to be something that is more specific to the world that you're creating and more specific to the characters that you're putting in there. Um, so those are the kinds of opportunities that I tend to look for when I'm editing and definitely mushrooms though. Yeah. Nice. Oh, I love that. Absolutely. Oh my, uh, Michael, let me hand it on to you as well. And, you know, just in terms of uh, editing, you know, I, I was the original question, but Another way to think about it as well is, do you start with world building or do you start with characters? Um, I usually start with premise, which often combines some basic element of world and character, because uh, I often end up thinking about stuff and I'm casting somebody who is exists in the inter like intersection or the kind of crisis point between elements of world building. Um, so like, okay, you've got a, like a galactic empire and then, uh, and they are basically erasing a lot of history. Okay. Somebody who is going to be at an interesting, like intersection or crisis point, it would be an archeologist, um, because they, they are literally unearthing history that has been erased from the galactic record. And so, um, doing something like that, another series of mine starts with the question, what if, um, genre knowledge was the special power that would let a group of people kind of do the thing that they needed to as adventurers. And then I would kind of um, unfold from the premise, which is how I, I tend to work. So I go from premise, like what is the world that's required for this premise to be interesting? And then who are the people who are going to be either the, stand, the most to gain or the most to lose or are going to let me illustrate what I want from the premise? Heck yeah. No, I totally appreciate that. And that is a third one that I did not say, you know, starting with the premise, <laughs> starting with the plot. So yeah, that was the perfect answer because those are the three ways kind of to start a story. Now, I'd say that a lot of the people at WriteFest are deep into a work in progress or have a manuscript and are really trying to hone it, to do something with it, to, you know, send it to an agent to do that, anything like that. When you think about a synopsis or you think about kind of a query or just you're on an elevator, you know, or you're at a, you're at a wedding and your aunt uh, 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 asks you, oh, you're writing a book. So what's it about? Does your world come up in that, you know, to start with? Or is it the character? Is that all? Oh, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it, Marshall, in a world. So like <laughs> if, you, if you start a pitch with in a world, it actually does work because it is shorthand potentially for the rest of the plot that's going to be unraveling. When you set things up with in a world, then it it sets up the status quo, which actually is a really good and useful way, like, like Michael was talking about, to get into the thing that you're writing. If you establish the status quo, then you are able to say, okay, who benefits from the status quo? Who is harmed by the status quo? What are the failure points of the status quo? And you can work your way out from there to figuring out your characters and how they act and interact with each other and what their goals and needs may end up being and what the stakes are for them if they lose, if they win. And so in a world is, is actually a decent way to start some kind of pitch. If it's an elevator pitch, it's not necessarily the best query start. And, uh, you know, in trailers, of course, we've gotten a little accustomed to it. But uh, that maybe don't use the phrase, but it's a good way to kind of lean into what's going on. Well, Marshall, Valerie name checked you right there. So obviously, you know, the question well, is coming to you. <laughs> that's that's because we, we had already discussed that on Twitter pre this pre the thing. But I do also find I've read like a number of like pitches and queries because I have because people will send them to me to ask my advice on that, where too much of the world building is put in the pitch query from the get go. And unless that element of the world building is so very specific to why everything else is happening or whatever central thing is happening to the character or the story you 
putting it within your pitch or your query tends to then be more distraction than anything else. I, I remember some where like give in the pitch itself gave this whole like digression of like what the, like the noble ranks were and everything. It's like this has nothing to do with the things that are going to sell me on the story. So the the in a world where is great if it's if it's a critical linchpin to what the story is about. But a lot of times, great world building is is so much the background of where the story takes place, but not necessarily that critical element of the story in and of itself. Fuck yeah. But Michael, have you you know thought about it ever? Is you know your your world building is foregrounded um uh, in any of your any of your stuff? Yeah, for sure. I have a novel where I would generally pitch it as um, in a city built amongst the bones of a fifty mile uh, long titan, and then I do the rest of the bit because I open with like here's a very cool striking image that will catch somebody's attention, and it contextualizes. Okay, uh, this is. We're in a setting where there are 50 mile tall titans. One of them is dead and there are people living there. Okay, this creates some interesting stuff going on and I can get somebody's attention that way because any given project can be pitched a bunch of different ways. And I found that with experience, I will adjust or pivot how I'm presenting something depending on context, depending on what I know about the person um, so that I try to not overload them, but I also try to meet them where they are in terms of what I know about their interests. Thank you. Absolutely. And Georgina, this, you know, of course, isn't just, you know, in a far flung place, you know, there are literary examples of setting being foregrounded. Uh, Sandra Cisneros, uh, uh, The House on Mango Street. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm going to forget the name, Tommy Orange, uh, uh, There, There, which doesn't sound like it, but it's there in the title, you know. Um, I, I, do you think that there are examples in literary or contemporary fiction uh, where either you or someone that you like uh, is foregrounding that, uh, that world of theirs? Yeah, I mean, I think all of you guys hit on it already. It, it kind of depends on um, who you're speaking to. For one thing, if you're querying an, an agent or if you're talking to an audience, you know, um, I think I would imagine in sci-fi and fantasy that it is much more in the forefront. Mm, mine is not so much, although my setting, as I said, was kind of a character in my book, um, in both the ones I'm working on, one one I'm working on now too. Um, but it's probably a little more nuanced, you know. Heck yeah. Um, uh, let me take this point to say for sure, if people have questions for our panelists, throw them into the chat here. Perfectly fine to toss them on Discord as well, um, I, uh, as well as links to things and stuff like that. I love it. Absolutely. Any of our panelists, if you have things that you are talking about that you want to toss into the chat as well, as far as your books or books and things that you're referencing, toss them in the chat so that people get some context as we're talking about them. Absolutely. But <clears throat> I'll say this. So I think it was uh, uh, Marshall earlier on talking about, hmm, how can I, how can I phrase this? Um, yeah, I'm going to get it wrong. I'm totally going to blank on it. Oh, um, I, 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 so Marshall, let me start with you and say, uh, do you let chance into your world building at all. And I take this as an example of talking to a literary fiction guy who's a, uh, in the MFA program at uh, University of Houston, but he did stat sheets like Dungeons and Dragons of like empathy and uh, uh, you know, like how much money they have and stuff like that for his characters and then rolled. And that determined how they reacted in situations. Um, do you let chance into your into your writing at all? I mean, the idea of like where the story would go being dictated by a dice roll just like made my heart flutter <laughs> just a little bit. Um, yeah, definitely wouldn't do that in terms of chance. But like certainly I am, I do so much of my world building work before I even really have figured out what the story is and even do, you know, before I even get to 
blocking that out and outlining. A lot of my world building process is a process of figuring out what the stories in that world are going to be and what can be the stories in there. And then I do a pretty intense outlining process before I really start writing. That being said, there is always room for plot jazz throughout <laughs> over the course of, of actually writing the book. I wouldn't say the outline is is laying out a map and figuring out what the what the path one is going to take to get from point A to point B to point C to point D. And then writing the book is actually doing that drive, which will not necessarily match what you planned out when you when you laid out the road trip. Uh, so yeah, I mean, you're always going to chance upon fun discoveries or be like, oh, that's a better reason why A to B to C connects rather than what I thought of when I was outlining. So, so I mean, I, I wouldn't so much as go so far as to is to let the the the, the whims of a dice roll <laughs> take it, but certainly, I mean, you 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 have to go where the winds take you. Heck yeah, Michael, do you have any thoughts on a uh, chance and uh, world building? Well, I haven't. Uh, I haven't really used them, but I know some writers who will utilize. Um, like a, a, a tarot deck or some kind of oracle system um, at crucial points, either because they don't really, they don't have a sense of where the plot should go next, or they're just looking for some kind of exterior input to respond to. Uh, like sometimes you get that idea of, well, you're, you're torn between two options. And so someone will say, okay, uh, pick, uh, like, uh, on heads, you do A, and you flip the coin. And sometimes as soon as the coin is flipped, the person knows what they actually prefer. Um, and so sometimes it just takes a little bit of something outside of yourself to kind of get the, the creative juices um, moving. So I've definitely heard about them, not used it myself. Heck yeah. Georgina, do, you ever, do your characters ever uh, not do what you want them to? Oh, you muted yourself. That was right yeah, all the time. I, I was thinking about that. Yeah, I do it a lot. Like, so I'm, I'm a panster. I don't, I don't, I have a general idea of, the core of the plot. So the, the book I'm currently writing it revolves around Hurricane Ike. And so we know in the book that what happened with Hurricane Ike, most, well, not everyone, but um, the, you know, it was a very destructive force. And, um, but the characters themselves, it's like a handful of characters that are colliding with this freak of nature. And each one of them, as the story develops, responds to it in a different way and ultimately their fate it depends on how they respond to it and so as because I don't go into the book knowing exactly what's going to happen with every one of my characters as the story unfolds I begin to realize oh beep this person's in trouble and they didn't leave when they were supposed to and something bad's going to happen and you know of course there's the you know, people are going to die because people died during Hurricane Ike on Bolivar Peninsula. And, you know, the, the few people I've shared it with are like, you're not killing off. Spoiler blank, blank, are you? And I'm like, hey, you know, it's not up to me. I'm just, I'm just curating this journey. I'm not in control of this to an extent, but they are the characters take on a life of their own for me. I love the idea as well of, you know, you get an idea, you start writing something, you're a pantser and you go out and visit the place. Yeah. And you're like walking through in your head, you know, what's happening, but I don't know. I research know, the, too, the a lot of research. Or whatever, absolutely. I mean, yeah, and just like talking to people and, and learning about their own experience and, you know, finding out about the lion that was discovered in the church on the peninsula after the storm. They went, it was just this wild lion. Well, not wild, he was a kind of a pet, but, you know, and just these true stories that are gems to just sneak into to my own version of what happened. I think I do remember as well the uh, very iconic picture of only one house yeah. remaining yes. on Bolivar. And it was specifically oh, reinforced to resist yeah. Hurricane, you know, yeah. by, uh, level four, you know, and every other house just yeah. completely gone. Yeah. Someone said they wanted to clarify. Was it panster? Is that what they wanted to clarify? Oh. So there's plotters and pansters. So pansters like the, you know the working off the seat of your pants. So you just kind of don't really plan things, and they just evolve sort of organically. And then there's um, 
plotters who who really have an outline and really plan out every event that's going to happen from beginning to end before they even start writing. I'm going to type in nanorimo.org, um, uh, which has those definitions and uh, uh, different things here about uh, that, as well as a great resource three months out of the year to uh, be held accountable to other people and try to write 50,000 words in a 30 day span. Um, uh, Valor, you have the headset as if you uh, play enough games to own that headset. So I'm going to guess that you have been thinking about your story while killing, I don't know, goblins, uh, uh, angel demons, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, that's what I should do. Yeah, I've, I've definitely been uh, plumbing the depths of Hades trying to escape, and my dad is super not into that. And uh, no, but um, video games, I think one of the things that I've learned from video games that I think is pertinent to world building and really useful, actually, what I play a lot of is Bioware games. And I've, I've, I'm currently doing a Mass Effect playthrough, and I did a Dragon Age playthrough last year. Uh, and one of the things that Bioware does extremely well is unreliable histories. And I think that is something that you can leverage in your world building and in your plot, potentially, depending on how much you want to rely on that. Uh, and it, it works also in sort of non-genre fiction in terms of just what do people remember? How do they remember it? How did they experience an event differently? And you can use that in your world building to create uh, sort of gaps and, and uh, uh, problems that can occur between different people who have different experiences of the event and different uh, understandings of the history that happened and how it went down. Uh, that is one of those potential like faction, you know, creators or failure points that what we talked about earlier. And uh, Bioware absolutely does uh, that um, just masterfully. And in, in our real world, history is something that is written by people. People are flawed. People get things wrong. People do research. People come to wrong conclusions based on information. And so all of those things you can use in your world building. And it, there's a tendency, especially in sci-fi and fantasy writing, to want to explain the things that you've done, like Marshall was saying earlier, to want to examine them and talk about them. And you put a lot of thought into them and you really want to. But it is actually worth thinking about how uh, received knowledge, how the game of telephone has been played over time, and how that can affect people today versus how things were back then. Uh, and you it, you are allowed to have people be wrong. It feels often, especially in video games, that when you find, you know, a codex entry that gives you the history of this particular location. And, you know, it feels as if you should be treating that as gospel. And yet, even the gospels were written by people. And so, you know, it's, it's useful to leverage that in your world building, basically. Allow your characters to be wrong and allow you, their knowledge of your world to be wrong. Uh, and um, another good essay on that is in the book Wonder Book, which is a really great one you should pick up. Jeff Vandermeer. Kat Malenti has an excellent essay about uh, what everyone knows and how you can use that to create sort of an accepted status quo of uh, things that people accept uncritically. And that's another way to approach that. Thank you. That was great. And that was a ton of information in this big. Yes, Jeff Vandermeer Wonder Book is a great craft book. Absolutely. And the idea of memory not exactly being correct uh, brings me to the idea as well of uh, uh, tell the reader. And a lot of times you can absolutely picture as a writer what's going on, where things are, what your character knows. But in a lot of cases, you have to turn around and specifically, you know, like paint the picture and paint it completely. Uh, Georgina, do you know of any examples in your work where, you know, you've, uh, uh, you, you've sat there and been like, okay, I'm going to do the, you know, the world or the, the room or the table um, uh, and had a great experience writing that? Yeah, um, so one of the, the places in my book was the Bolivar Lighthouse, which has a very strong history. It's a um, uh, Civil War lighthouse. It's been reconstructed once or twice. And um, um, I didn't get to see it because it's, it's in bad shape right now and you can't really tour it, but they're trying to restore it. Um, so I had to speak to people who knew the lighthouse and and just imagine what it would be like inside. And um, I um, used it kind of as a sort of symbol throughout the book of this idea of, well, two things really, solitude of just this lone, straight, you know, sort of stark figure, dark, black, um, but also as a, as a place of, of um, 
safe haven, right? The lighthouse. Um, and so it became a really important symbol for me. And I really tried so hard to get, to really dig deep and, and kind of zoom close and, and try to enable my characters to not just imagine what it looks like, but to the smell and feel of the iron um, exterior and the bricks inside. And, you know, it was actually really cool because I finally did get a tour like about a couple of weeks ago. And um, the, the people who owned it, said you've toured this before right and I said no this is my first time and they said you you wrote that so clearly I thought you'd been here so that made me feel great that I had brought that thing to life even though it was really just from afar in my own experience at the time um, but I think when that comes across to the reader that can be a really powerful way of drawing them in and and also that subtext of like trying to you know when you spend so much time describing one thing whether it's a room or a, a forest or whatever it is you're you're sort of indicating to your reader okay slow down here this is important this is this means something more than what it might initially seem to mean right and so it's like this signpost of like this is important just take your time and think about it and and it reveals those underlayers no, that is, that is awesome. And I love that you, you know, I, I basically, you know, had someone say, oh my gosh, you, you've been here before because of, because you're ready. Absolutely. Yeah. Michael, Michael, have you ever had, uh, you know, a, a, a giant Titan from another dimension portal into your room and be able to shake your book at you and say, you've been here. I can't believe it. Uh, well, I do a lot of tabletop role playing, so it, that's not as untrue as one might think. Um, <laughs> because, like, something that I bring into craft is that experience in role playing, and when I'm able to tap into that most effectively, uh, I can do kind of what Valerie was talking about in terms of uh, in incorporating worldview and accepted knowledge of the people. Um, and I tend to write fairly close third person. So not first person, but third person that is very much informed by the POV character, which will then let me convey not just the world, but the world through the perspective of the individual character. Um, and something I wanted to talk about kind of building on like an, um, the question of exposition is that in fan fantasy and science fiction, one of our kind of current work, like living legends, N.K. Jemisin, has a um, incredibly critically acclaimed series uh, called The Broken Earth. And in the first book of that, the fifth season, um, the book, the basically, it's a, a world that is both foreign and familiar, but instead of stopping and slowing down to do a ton of explanation, it just throws you really immediately and deeply into the lived experience and the emotional landscape of a character. So it's fully on the side of immersion and keep the camera close. And then as you follow that person, you get to learn about the world, which is can be a useful approach depending on like your overall goal with the project. You know, maybe you want to do some explanation here so that then you can just kind of take off at a start or if you're going to do like a longer investigation of the world, maybe you want to lean toward immersion and figure out how to orient the reader enough so that you can kind of pull them through these things that they will then come to understand are more um, unfamiliar than maybe they originally thought. Thank you. Heck yeah. Well, Marshall, you are unmuted. So I'm going to go to you next, which is, yeah. Was there a time, you know, like, do you remember any moment when someone was specifically like, ah, oh, love this uh, uh or is it that you enjoyed really writing uh in describing a place or a yeah um it, it's not a, it's not a one-to-one -one, but it is sort of similar to uh to what georgina was saying in that like a lot of the descriptive stuff you know i draw from a lot of sources of you know the way the the city of meridine is supposed to look and i, I try to make it as feel as lived in as possible. And uh, I remember my mother did a trip to some village in England and she's like, is this what he based it on? But he's never even been to England or <laughs> anything like that. So I found that at least intriguing. But like one of the things that Michael was saying really clicked in with me that you, you know, in keeping that sort of tight camera and keeping it within, keeping your world building within, you know, that 
perspective and showing the world through that perspective. A big thing, I think, of what the whole world building process is and how you put that on the page is taking the presumptions of your reader and challenging them and saying like, okay, this is how you think the world is supposed to work based on your own lived experience. And no, this is how this world actually works. And using that character point of view to show the way the world actually works and what the presumptions of their own world are going to be. So if you have say, you know, that like marriage or relationships do not work the same way in your world as they do, you know, here in, you know, Western America, then you show that through the character and show their feelings of a what is normal to them is not the is going to be something completely different heck yeah no absolutely uh valerie do you have any thoughts on the on the subject of going in deep dive you know describing uh a situation a place a time yeah, I think that, as other people have said, pulling from your own experiences is a good way to uh, imbue uh, what you're doing with verisimilitude. And that, especially for, for fantasy, that can mean taking something that is real and, you know, making it be a fantasy version of itself. And so uh, I have a work in progress that it it is sort of a fantasy version of Miami, but it is still set in a time period that is closer to, like, Regency technology. And so having to think about how, like, okay, a city that is like this, the people are like this, but change the technology level, what what happens, what shifts, what's different. Uh, and so still being able to rely on things like, this is what the weather feels like here, as opposed to, you know, uh, having to imagine something completely uh, outside of my experience. Um, thinking about like what the kinds of clothes that they would wear based on the weather that that's going on, how things would exist without air conditioning. Um, in, in some of the short fiction that I have, I, I have a story in Nightmare Magazine that takes place in a movie theater. I used to work in a movie theater, and so I was able to draw very um, closely from that experience in terms of not just the physicality of the location, but also the inner workings of what goes on there, what people do, what kinds of chores they have to do, when those things occur, um, what are what are typical, you know, trials and tribulations that people undergo when they're doing that kind of stuff. Um, and so those are all things, like, it, it's very similar to is really what you're looking for when you are pulling from your own experiences it does not have to be a one-to-one -one correlation but it does help you to put in those details that um, make the reader believe the thing it's like if you tell um, a lot of little truths then you can tell a big lie and it is more uh, accessible and more uh, believable thank you heck yeah now there is definitely something to be said for using your own experience and not telling oh my i uh, i love the idea of this being you know uh, a way for people who are already working on things who already have most of a novel put together as a way to deepen you know what they're working on to make their world a character and it can be fantasy it can be insane it can be far away or it can be you know one block away from your house but how much do you outright steal from history um uh, your own life your friends and uh, uh their silly things your memories of childhood uh who should i start with michael I think uh, this is one of many uh, questions where the answer is probably it depends. Um, like if if you're drawing on your own like family history, cultural history, um, you know, like national inheritance, um, a, a book I'm working on now is very much like processing um, the feelings of like becoming an adult and learning all the things I was lied to about American history um, and like kind of doing something with that. Um, if you are kind of borrowing from the real world outside of kind of your immediate sphere of experience, um, it will probably serve you very well to, um, as Georgina did, like consult heavily with the people for whom that is their everyday life. Um, in terms of like putting your friends into books, you probably want to ask if you're, if they could read it without you knowing anything of what you've done, they'd be like, hey, that's me. What did you do? Um, so like, I tend to just take little tiny bits from a bunch of places and then do bricolage so that the act of assembly is its own creative process so that it's never just, um, you know, this is X with the serial numbers filed off, though sometimes that works. 
Well, that's, you know, so not the whole cloth David Sedaris method. Absolutely. Instead, and I know you've read this book, Valerie, um, uh, the story towards the end of uh, Jeff Vandermeer's world book, wonder book, where George R.R. R. Martin is talking about being on Hadrian's wall. And it's a moment in time that's very real, but led to, you know, like the whole Game of Thrones series. Not that he wrote it, you know, for 10, 12 years or so after that experience, but is there anything in your real life that you have brought into your writing? Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely, for example, the movie theater experience, that was something that uh, I, I wrote straight into it. But um, I also have, uh, I'm, some, I'm working on something that I can't get into too much, but it, it does involve um, trips that I've taken to different places. Uh, you know, I, I'm able to fold in, say, like, okay, you know, I went through the catacombs in Rome, and that's something that I can draw on that experience. I, I went through um, a, a jungle with worms hanging from the trees, and I can add that detail into somebody wor walking through the jungle. Um, and going back to the elements of randomness earlier, I think that that, that can be really useful is if you are stuck. Uh, our brains are pattern-seeking, and so uh, you can pull sort of some minute detail into a scene that you're working on that may seem like it doesn't fit but if it is random if it is something that you just look around your room and are like what I need something I don't know what it is or you go on a walk outside and you you try to find something um you you may encounter a thing that helps you uh I think actually even in Wonderbook there's a, a good discussion of how somebody was was not quite nailing the world building for a book they were working on until they found a detail about uh, a time period in a, the medieval period they were writing about where it rained for like three straight years in the location roughly where they were writing. And so that is exactly the kind of detail that you can leverage to create something that is more emotionally affecting and more, again, the verisimilitude. That is really what you're looking for. Um, and just moments like that are, are priceless. It, it helps you to, uh, we, we now have the ability to go on Google Maps and do street views of everything and do walkthroughs of things. I actually did a walkthrough of a national park here in Georgia that I couldn't reach, but uh, being able to do that and just look around into the place, even though I'm not physically there, so I can't experience all the different sensory um, elements of it, it helps a lot. It helps a lot to really locate you in that. Nice. Uh, Georgina, we've already spoken for sure about Bolivar Peninsula and how these real world experiences, you know, have, have gone into your work. Um, but is there anything you want to add to, you know, about how specific moments or maybe a photograph or something becomes you know like comes alive as you're writing oh i'm that's all i do that all the time that's how i write in fact i i choose i basically choose my my story based on the world i know intimately like we we had a beach house on bolivar for eight years so i spent a lot of time down there um I grew up in England, so one of my current works in progress takes place in England. And I just, you know, it's funny because sometimes my 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 memoir friends are like, what why don't you just write a memoir? And I said, Oh no, no, no. I can't go all the way there. I have to have the room to bring in a character I need to do, to move the plot forward or have a twist that that I have to invent or um there's, there's, yeah, so I, I, I don't write memoir, but it's such a fine line for me. It's really close. So I pull from, yeah, memories, you know, places, people, everything. I just, yeah, steal it all. <laughs> Marshall, anything? Uh, uh, oh, yes, please. <laughs> um, no one singular specific thing, just because, like, so much of my process involves like taking like all the different things in my brain of people and places and events and pop culture and throwing it into the blender and putting it on high and seeing what the smoothie that comes out is like. Um, but I mean, but there's also so much to be said about the idea, because we talked about like starting with character or starting with world or starting with premise. There, there is so much to be said about starting with aesthetic and just using that as your, you know, what, what it's going to look like and what it's going to feel like and using that as your launching point. Um, with my 
book, Velocity of Revolution, that literally came from my son was buying himself some raw denim jeans in this shop that had like this old motorcycle just in the middle of the shop. And he looked at me and we, were, we had just come from dinner at a taco place. It's like, why is it all these fantasy novels? They're all like Ren Fair and stew and turkey legs and not, you know, not tacos and denim and motorcycles. And I went, why can't a fantasy novel be tacos and denim and motorcycles? And, <laughs> and just went from there, mushroom empanadas. Yes, I also used magical psychic mushrooms that link people's brains together too in this book. So there, that's my pitch for world building by aesthetic. And I also got to pitch my own damn book in the process. <laughs> yes, make sure, make sure to toss the link in the chat. Absolutely, heck yeah. Oh my, uh, I'm gonna grab this cause it's close, but I, I, if y'all know the Marlon James um, uh, series, uh, I think it started with a, a Red Wolf, Black Leopard. Um, this uh, started off with him having a conversation with another author and saying, how come uh, the Tolkien series, Lord of the Rings, is, it's all English, you know, uh, uh, it's all Western European myths. What would happen if uh, there was an African one? And it was just a conversation and he just steps away. And then, you know, like this guy who's writing literary fiction decides, you know what, I'm going to do it. And that is a brutal, ridiculous, oh, my uh, fantasy series that's only at two out of three. But uh, um, it is like super deep and very into the world building and references that, you know, you, you feel like you don't get, but you don't understand, you know, what the minds of Moria really look like other than how the author describes them you feel like you know it afterwards and i think that that changes how the experience of reading you know past tense was and i really love how he goes through this neti akorafor is another one that i love to reference as well with dropping things in there that you might get you might not and it is amazing in how just uh, uh letters that form a word oh my i uh, bring a ton to world building let me ask y'all, I uh, what are your examples? Do you have any recommendations of books that really were really excelled at world building? Georgina, I'm going to put you right on the spot and give everybody else 30 seconds to Google or look around the room at their books out there because uh, there are so many. But um, the one that comes to mind that made such a strong impression on me is called Bone People by Carrie Holm. And she's a um, New Zealand writer. Um, and I don't, I've never been to New Zealand. I don't know um, too much about the culture, but after reading that book, and it, it wasn't a history of the culture or anything like that. Like all you, you guys are saying, it's, it's her response to her environment. And the reader understands that environment through the main character and how she navigates through it. And it's specific to her but it's done in such a way that it brings every nuance to life. Like she lives near the water on the beach and she actually lives in a tower, kind of like a lighthouse. And she, she catches her own fish to eat. It's, a, it's contemporary, but um, she's very isolated and um, sort of misanthropic. And um, just the way that Carrie Holm, the specificity of that world and even the language, there was a lot of Maori in there which, you know, like you were saying, Sean, I don't, I mean, I don't understand, or I think it was you, yeah, I don't understand Maori, but because of the context, you, you understood what she was thinking and saying, and, and just the, the, the natural world, and the animals, and fish, and birds in that world, and, and it's a very interior book, so a lot of it is just her thinking, and observing, and it's just written so beautifully, and so, um, so much detail, but with a really fascinating pot plot that is very psychological and, and emotional and some human interaction, it's fairly dark too. But that book is one of my favorite, um, you know, settings, bringing settings to life and informing your story based on where it's happening. Thank you, heck yeah. Um, who's got the, uh, the impetus to, uh, to hop in? Marshall, yes. All right, my big, if I'm going to shout about somebody's world building, I'm going to go with uh, Fonda Lee's Greenbone Saga, which, is, yes, <laughs> Mike is with me on this one. Um, it is just a brilliant series where 
the world building is so specific to the story and goes in such depth of how the culture of you know of the island nation that is the main setting of, of the world is is interacts with itself and how that drives the story in itself but then as the series continues we then also see so much more of the outer world and how they perceive the main culture that we're we're looking at and also then you see like the diaspora culture of people from this this nation when they're living in other parts of the world and then we're also seeing it through the over the course of all three books over the, the span of time so you see multiple generations and how things shift generationally it's just brilliant i could i could rave about it for for days and it's just great work right there heck yeah master class in world building in, in one series <laughs> So, Valerie, what is your favorite world-building book that includes Bone in the title? Oh, no, I, I don't, I, I don't, well, The Bone Shard Daughter, um, I actually have not, I have Oh, not yeah, read you that have yet. one. Oh, no, oh, oh, oh yeah! Uh, Andrew Stewart, everybody should definitely read that one. Um, listen, there's a lot of good books, okay, I, I was almost going to do a phrasing, uh, oopsie there. Okay, the one I wanted to talk about, though, instead um so t king fisher has a really great series it starts with uh clockwork boys and i really love the world of that series because i think it is an excellent take on paladins who are somewhat maligned in popular literature in a lot of ways and uh she does a lot of really rich world rich world building to pull together a place that feels kind of like almost steampunk um and i i just i love it and i love the ways in which uh religion are treated in that world and i love the ways in which magic manifests i'm a big fan of um, magic that is not extremely explained as opposed to magic that has a really rigorous system like Brandon Sanderson tends to do. Uh, so things things like, you know, Robin McKinley or Patricia McKillop are, are more my speed when it comes to magical stuff. And, uh, but yeah, I think that, that T. King for sure, aka Laverne, aka awesome person, um, puts together really cool worlds and then inhabits it with characters that have flaws and that are products of those worlds, which I think is really good and important. Heck yeah, thank you. I don't know if Georgina's trying to add something. Oh no, she was just oh, saying. Yourself. I was just, yeah, uh, typing something in the chat. I, when you talked about magic, I love magical realism and that's uh, a great opportunity to build in some um, sort of that crossover between reality and fantasy. I use that in my writing too. I'm gonna ask about that in a second, but first off, we need Michael's favorite world building book including bone in the title uh, i can't give you bone but i can give you amazing fight scenes yes okay um, fine i already shouted out the fifth season which is very high on my list but um one i uh i keep thinking about and i'm awaiting the third book is savage legion by matt wallace um matt and i had novellas out with some um some fun overlap um a few years ago when the Tor.com novella program got started. And so that's how we kind of met and, and became friendly colleagues. Savage Legion is set in a utopia. It is a, a kingdom, definitely not an empire, that has solved problems and there's no royalty. And like it, it purports itself to be this wonderful place, but it is that is maintained, we come to learn as the reader, um, by taking all of the undesirables and political prisoners and shunting them into basically a shock troop um, infantry legion that fuels the empire's expansionist agenda. So you get your epic fantasy battles, you get your underdog fights, you get your intrigue, and all of it is conveyed in a fashion that is nicely distinct from Kind of more traditional western european fantasy while still being incredibly relatable fun characters and beautiful fights nice heck yeah um the the last little thing because we're running out of time is let me ask does anybody have any opinions on where is the line between magical realism and fantasy where's the line I have Stop. A hot take. I have some hot takes too. I'll let Mike start with the hot takes. We don't have a lot of time. All the hot takes right now. Marketing categories and racism. <laughs> we are in agreement. <laughs> Anyone else? Yeah. 
No, I think they nailed it. <laughs> like, there is, you know, there's this thing, I think, with awards that literary fiction and, you know, like, genre fiction are, are kind of siloed. And it, it, doesn't, it doesn't have to be that way. And, you know, in looking at uh, uh, history and stuff, there was a moment where I, I what is it? Oh, um, my, I, let's just, let's just go with Kurt Vonnegut. Kurt Vonnegut, you know, like, could have gotten those sci-fi awards. Maybe Philip K. Dick could have won a, a, a literary one. And what would our history of, you know, like, looking at, at books and stuff like that been over the past 40, 50 years? And it feels like, fifth season was already brought up, that there are some books that really should have pushed, you know, between the line of why that happened. Oh um, my, uh, I'm going to throw up to a, or throw out to a, a Angelique here on the chat saying, can we make it a little more clarity on marketing and racism? Because I, I understood what you meant. Let's go there. Uh, I will uh, pass the ball to Valerie if she wants to take it. Okay, so there are a couple ways in which this manifests, and one of them has to do with the fact that magical realism, while it did not necessarily originate in Latin America, is a, a genre that is extremely rooted in that tradition and has since then been expanded to encompass eff effectively anything that is fantasy that occurs in a modern context, basically. And so that is one way in which racism manifests, but another way that it manifests is that a lot of times, if non-white authors are writing fantasy type stuff, even if it could potentially be categorized as magical realism, it gets shunned it into fantasy instead, uh, which is, I, in terms of um, the sci-fi that I write, the joke that we make is that, oh, I'm not writing serious sci-fi, I'm writing the pew pew pew. And so there are those kinds of like genre uh, expectations and um, uh, I hate to use the term ghetto because that is actually a really un ugly term for it, but there is a sort of separation that occurs between what is considered more highbrow and what is considered more lowbrow. And a lot of times what separates that, unfortunately, is the background of the author. George Saunders, it, it feels like a huge example to me where he won a ton of awards, got all these things, um, uh, was the literary fiction par excellence, you know, like a... Uh, uh, Time Magazine, The New Yorker, whatever. And then you go look at his stories and he's like, uh, they are doing experiments on people to mess with your brain and you'll change reality. And also they sell children to hang in your yard as a, like, like they hold up lights, you know? And I'm like, this is fantasy. This is, you know, like two steps away from where we are. It reflects on existence, but so does fantasy. So does sci-fi world building. Why is this literary fiction, what is it, Lincoln and the Bardo, Lincoln talking to his uh, uh, dead son and having conversations with ghosts was not put in fantasy, was not put in, you know, like horror. It was put into literary. So totally understand that. And thank you for uh, uh, you guys in the uh, uh, chat. You know, I hope that those explanations uh, help for sure. Uh, Valerie, don't get me started on how BIPOC women get shoved into YA even when they're writing adult, oh, this is so true. Oh my, uh, it's it's juvenilia. You know, it is saying, oh, this is for over here, and uh, it really is uh, insulting. I'm, I'm terribly sorry, Valerie. Um, magical realism is still considered literary in those circles. Uh, there's a line, Angelique, um, that is not, um that is not hard and fast. Uh, and fantasy, even if you wrote something that could be considered magical realism, you'll get told to sit in the back of the bus with fantasy. Um, uh, sorry, I'm a sci-fi writer. I'm in the back of the bus too. Uh, like if, if it isn't what would be considered highbrow. And if it is considered highbrow and you sit in the front of the bus and you get a marketing budget from your publisher, uh, more likely than not, um, I, I, you know, you're going to be of a background um, uh, that makes it easier for you to be sold to people who consider themselves highbrow or want to leave your book on their coffee table. If that helps. We are at the end of time. Definitely throw all of your books and cool things that you guys are making. Georgina, Michael, Marshall and Valerie. Thank you guys so much for a lovely conversation. And Thank this is you, 
the entire conference. We just did the entire conference right here, right now. Holly's going to be very happy and go to sleep. I nap now. <laughs> <laughs> I got to go back to work. Good work, Holly. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Holly. We're the only people with microphones. Applause for Holly <laughs> and Jamie and names that I'm not remembering. Kathy is on there. Janet is on there. Oh, my. Uh, we really appreciate all of you guys for putting together a great Bright Fest this year. Rose is giving applause for Holly. Oh, my. I uh, really appreciate it. And thank you guys so much for hanging out and talking to me about world building as character. I look forward to finding your books. I appreciate it very much. Thank you. Take care, y'all. <laughs>